computer. I'm Bruce McGee. And I'm Steve Payne. And we're here today with Jacqueline Couty. Is that how you say your name? Perfect. You know, the French is in you, <laughs> Jacqueline Couty. <laughs> I've been studying French for our project, and I'm not any good at it, but uh, you know, if you keep at it long enough, you'll eventually get somewhere. Um, oh, uh, Bienvenue <laughs> Louisiane Anthology, is that right? Yeah, see, I'm telling you, perseverance. Bienvenue. Uh, bienvenue, Stephen, merci. Etienne. <laughs> Etienne. <laughs> I studied it in college, but I forgot most of mine. It's been 35 years ago, so long Steven's time ago. better with the pronunciation by a long part, uh, long shot. So we're so happy to have you here today, and uh, you're uh, joining us to talk about um, a folk tale that Stephen and I are getting ready to do a presentation over. And there's very little research I've been able to find. Uh, it, and then you have this beautiful like, <laughs> chapter in a book or something um, about. Um, the marriage of Jabe is that, how do you say? Uh, yeah, Maya's job. Maya's job. Mm -hmm. Ah, cool. And uh, before we get to the story, tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm an endowed chair uh, at Rice University. I was born in Martinique. I grew up in France. Then I did some, uh, you know graduate work in England, then I went to the US. So I'm a traveler. Uh, and I think that's important to understand the, the tale we're going to do uh, you know, nowadays, how it travels. And it really overlaps with your field of study, which you kind of look at the influences of the Caribbean and uh, South Louisiana culture that come from both the local folks and then uh, Africa and then France and it uh, got over here and it all just kind of got mixed together. Um, a gumbo exactly. as you sometimes say. And that's totally creolization, you know, what people call creolization, you know, right. this kind of meeting of culture, which at times can be violent, but I like to call it uh, cross pollination because I don't want to have a kind of hierarchy of power. I like the idea that you have different people who met and then something happens. And I think the, uh, the tale we're going to discuss today is a great uh, example about that uh, because, you know, uh, I teach a course on fairy tale. And this is a particular tale I, I look at for my students. And I looked at, uh, and the title, the first title was Damned Sex in Fairy Tales and Folk Tales from the African Diaspora. Because oh, you, know, right. you have to make things sexy for the students. Um, you got to fill the class up. Uh, exactly. You, you know our struggle. And when I look at this tale, I realize that uh, literally, originally, you know, you have some variants of this tale in West Africa, and some also in the ocean, uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean. And then I was like, and then you have this in Martinique, of the island in the Caribbean, and the U.S. So obviously, this tale has traveled with enslaved Africans uh, to different, uh, you know, spaces, um, you know, in, in, of the world. And it's very interesting what people are doing with the tale. Right. Does yeah. it does it strike Does it strike you? And Bruce and I were talking about this, getting ready for, to do this presentation for that Louisiana Studies Conference. That almost every folk tale has within it embedded within it a travel log. Because they're moving around just like the people that tell the things move around. So it's got almost an inherent travel log or travel narrative that's sort of hidden in the in the story. Uh, exactly, because I think uh, in one of the articles from Lee uh, Herring, I think I was reading, it was kind of very interesting. She was explaining that, you know, one of the main theme of the tale is the danger of marrying outside of the community. Mm -hmm. And to show this danger, literally, you have this young oh. woman who is going to be dragged all over the place. And in some tales, she has to cross oceans, she has to climb mountains. So I think this travelogue um, could be the idea that, you know, outside of a community is scary. Mm -hmm. So you better marry within the community, no, not with the sexy stranger. Uh, because, you know, uh, stranger danger. Uh, 
And the thriving is also this idea that the world is, you know, a dangerous place. And each tell shows that very, I think, accurately. And uh, we have in our collection, we, uh, the Louisiana Anthology is an online collection of texts about Louisiana. And we're almost to 10 million or 9 million words. Uh, once we get to 9 million, we're going to start saying we're almost. <laughs> but um, we've been really trying to, and it's tough because it's in Creole and nobody at our school understands it, but we've been trying to get as many Creole folk tales from uh, Forche's work mainly, um, although we have had some others uh, on, our, on our website. And one is um, The Marriage of Compare Le Pen. Mm -hmm. um, in the original Compare Le Pen, who, Brer Rabbit uh, analog, the, you know, our version we have in Louisiana, he, um, the, the, the Tar Baby is very close to the Senegal uh, story. Uh, but then the, the next story, the marriage of uh, uh, Compare Le Pen, it seems to, to me to have been composed in Louisiana because all of a sudden, uh, instead of the African savanna, you've got this huge river. Well, you know, if you've been to Laura Plantation, it's over yes. the levee to the Mississippi. It's, it's, yeah, it's on the river road. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and also they've got a priest. Also, they've got a, a tale that they embed in there from... Um, you know, how the dog, my dogs sniff each other's butts. <laughs> I said, oh, no, that can't. And I looked it up and uh, sure enough, it was an Aesop fable that they'd embedded. And then at the end, he's rewarded by being uh, given a, a beautiful, rich, white rabbit heiress to marry by the king. And uh, but he's a little upset because uh, when she has a litter of uh, baby rabbits, uh, some of them are brown. And oh, no. the king tells him, that's all right, compare Le Pen. Uh, sometimes these white rabbits have brown babies. And obviously it's all the, you know, the laden with the racism of Louisiana, right? And uh, innuendos too, yes. But you know, I think you're totally right. Those tales will travel. And sometimes the structure of the framework escaped, but then the content is going to be adapted to the space. Right, and right, right. So when you look at, uh, you know, um, and compare Lapin, uh, literally a lot of, you know, all these uh, tales from Louisiana are more Louisiana grounded. When you have the tale with the, the spider, Anansi, this is found, you know, in West Africa, in the Caribbean, but the minute that you start having, you know, a rare rabbit and all his friends, those I think, are more um, American, mm -hmm. and but but still you could find you know the the origins you know like right. uh, the kind of what's the lesson of a story, uh, and that's and, and that's why I love uh, looking at those tales and and what fascinated me was this idea that you cannot just say that people you know enslaved Africans have forgotten the past. It's not that some mm, tales yeah, were kept right then others really evolved. And Maya's job is one of them because then you have also a fusion and I will send you the information about Patricia Moiseau, which is a Martinican author as a, a book in English that can interest you, uh, Creole Folktales. And then there's a version of Maya's job in it. Oh, cool. And the version, in the Martinican version, it's a beautiful, you know, a mixed race woman, of course, and she's very, uh, you know, uh, elegant. And of course, she doesn't like any other people. She wants the perfect man, which is a white man with uh, blue teeth. Right. I don't know why the, the teeth have to be blue. Uh, I think, you know, because whenever something is blue, it's almost white, you know, bright white. Right, um, right. And of course, it turns out to be the devil. Right, right, right. Well, and so let's get to the, the story of the day, the... Uh, the marriage of, again, how do you say that? Maya's job. Maya's job. Okay. Um, and we'll go into, this is a part I know a little about. I went to um, New Orleans Baptist Seminary for several years and studied Greek. And so um, the word itself is transliterated over from French, uh, diable, 
uh, which goes back to the Greek diabolos. And mm-hmm. the word is from balo, which means to throw, and dia, which is um, a preposition. It can mean a bunch of stuff, but basically it means like through or is what's one that? Of the main- does it mean can it mean through i can't yeah through or because but here it means kind of to cast aspersions or to uh uh, slander somebody and it's used in the greek old testament the septuagint to translate the word satan satan from uh, job so that's why we translate it into the english as the devil's marriage but i don't think he's really that devil uh what have you you know how do you identify this character that's uh, named? So, so basically, when we say the devil, because in a lot of African, West African variant, is a wide animal, is a demon. Do you know what I mean by the demon? Meaning right. like this kind of animal with, you know, a personality and, mm-hmm. you know, with midship and magical. So right. in the original uh, West African tale, it's always some type of animal which is going to borrow, or a wild devil, you know, or demon, going to borrow other parts from other animals to create this magnificent man. In the, Car- in the Caribbean tales, because I think by that time they traveled to the Caribbean, you have the strong influence of Catholicism. Then this kind right. of animal, demon <clears throat> type became the devil. Uh, but it's, sort type of a trickster yeah but you know so then i think when the tale comes to uh the americas then it's the it's the devil literally because you have uh, the uh, influence of catholicism is he ever kind of a feral like a feral creature at all do you know Uh, at least in the in the west african originals really to be more uh, accurate yes oh yeah i mean in the west african uh sometimes it's it's a lion but sometimes it's just some so type of demon, uh, meaning like a spirit, but a, a kind of bad spirit. Uh, so it depends really, I think, of the, the ethnic group cre- you know, creating or recreating uh, this tale. But what was interesting, it's always the epitome of what is not the community. Right, right of a danger, it's always, you know, this, and most of the time, this kind of character is uh, some type of cannibal, (laughs) trying to eat the the young women. Uh, Yeah, so literally, so it's not, in the West African tale, of course, it's not the Christian devil, but it's the kind of, you know, uh, entity they will have in the space, which is still very uh, scary. (laughs) So would, there be any, would there be any crossover with voodoo or anything like that with this uh, kind of deity? Well, as you know, voodoo was kind of developed uh, right, <coughs> you know, after the, uh, oh, got strengthened during the Haitian uh, revolution. So I read some Haitian tales. You do have similar kind in some stories uh you know we, we have the sorceresses uh you do have some evil women trying to eat women but i don't think or oh, babies most of the time i try to get babies um like the sirene the mermaid uh but i didn't find a version of maya's job uh in the asian tale that would be interesting i will have to look into that i found this version uh, in some English speaking island for <laughs> a weird reason, uh, you know, like Martinique, Guadeloupe, of course, uh, in the US, in Louisiana. But in Haiti, the tales that I got so, seems to be very Haitian. Because at one point, the country was just, you know, after the Haitian Revolution, it was just locked, you know, like right. the country is just did a kind of blockade. So I think, and this is where Vodou was there before, but this is where Vodou really uh, strengthened. And, and I think, uh, you know, so when you had some, uh, right before, yeah, right at the revolution, when some white Creoles left Saint-Domingue with their slave and came to uh, Louisiana, 
of course, you know, they brought Voodoo and they brought some story, but I don't know if Maya's job came at that time. Right. But I think it's, it's a good point. Maybe it would be interesting to look well, the, at. The little research I've done, I've seen people comparing to say, um, um, oh, Papa, like, which one was it? Um, like that? Maybe the guy that looks like a skeleton has a top hat. Or some, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. or, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't know. Well, if, uh, yeah, that, well, that brings up a question then, well, based on what Bruce said. So do they masquerade as human beings ever? <clears throat> these particular creatures do they oh yes yes because literally the devil and it's kind of funny uh so in one story uh so one story it's of uh, the girl we didn't want to marry a man with a scar because you know he's damaged whatever though for a particular community it's the real man because you know he's been to battles but she, she doesn't want a man with a scar so that particular devil takes body parts of other animals to become a particular, a beautiful man. So it's always animals disguising themselves in perfect men. So one of the lessons, you know, of the story is like perfect men do not exist. <laughs> <laughs> if you meet one, you know it's the devil. Um, but what is interesting, so, you know, like in the US, you may say that a woman has kind of doe eyes, you know, mm -hmm. like or uh, so the devil is going to take body parts of an animal that are used i think to celebrate a particular beauty of a human being and in the particular ethnic you know so because some, some some things for me didn't make any sense but you know the devil would take the eye it wasn't it wasn't a rat but it was kind of an animal like that with big big eyes and i was like that is not sexy but then i realized oh but when you think about doe eyes for us sometimes we use that to say that it's a woman with beautiful eyes so you know boosters also show different uh, aspect of beauty what is beautiful um, right so, so you're right Stephen. literally the that devil whatever it is and sometimes it's a straight animal but sometimes it's just a devil, which means... that's that's a little bit like the legends in um, in some of the Native American traditions. I, th I think the Navajo and there's a couple yeah, of others, exactly. But the so-called you know, we... skinwalker. Yes, and they, yes. Yeah. And, and, and the skinwalker is almost always a character of evil. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and this, too, fits. This is bizarre. It fits with what is coming along as. Louisiana becomes an American territory in 1803. So this is right before that to the period right after it, the so-called dark romantic tradition in, in Western European literature. And it's a variation of the romantic, but it's it's related to the Gothic. So you get the characters who, <clears throat> that's why I asked that about masquerading as a human or also being feral, uh, having weird uh, colored eyes that goes with it a lot of the time too. So they may not be necessarily large, but they're a strange color. They may be really pale eyes or they may be a strange shade of gray like a steel gray or something like that. Uh, they usually have a uh, preternatural sort of aura around them. They have um, uh, usually superhuman strength, et cetera. And it survives today with comic book characters like Batman and the Black Panther. I mean, they come right out of that tradition. Both yes, of them come I, out of that tradition. And I think that's the, that's the beauty of folk tales. So that's why I like you know, this idea of cross-pollination because at the end of the day, we don't even know what is the origin, but right, we know right. that several strands have fed a particular story. And the story like Maya's job, literally, you have the West African origin, but then you also have, you know, the European origin, the French origin with Bluebeard. You know, the story yeah, go, Bluebeard. go into <laughs> the origins of this because it seems to come from both France and Africa in some of its folkloric roots. Yeah, yeah, because Basically, they all merge and meet in the Americas. Mm -hmm. And this is how, so I will, as I said, I will send you the, uh, um, the PDF of you know, the book of Patrick Chamoiseau, because literally is the Mayash Jab fused with Bluebeard, Charles Perrault's Bluebeard, because literally, and I think that's why the main character has blue teeth. Right, right. Know, as a variant of Bluebeard, because during the tale, suddenly the young girl is brought in a house and in the basement of the house, you have all the previous uh, women of the, you know, the devil 
you know, being chilled there. And right. she's like, oh my God, I need to go out. And so are those just the skins hanging up or like, has he just killed them and hung them as is or did he you skin so them and eat the in, in the what is this? original story of Barbara Blue, I think it's just like, you know, cut their heads or just like uh, put a knife on, on the neck and they just hang them there. So there's like a trophy in, room. It's a trophy yes, room. Yeah, it's a trophy it's, room. I mean, it's it's macabre as that sounds, yeah. Yeah, and so disturbing. But this is what I tell my students. When I start this course, I, I like to start with European tales because I'm like, see, we all messed up, okay? When we're going to go to the US and when we're going to go to the, you know, Africa, I don't want to hear anyone saying, oh, you know, those people, they have weird things and tales. I'm like, look at all the folktales we have in Europe. Uh, Ansel and Gretel, you know, like, right. mm -hmm. them, uh, really scary. Or Red Little, uh, Little Riding Hood, you know. Yeah, like, the Grimm's fairy tales. Woo! Right, exactly. They're grim. And they're pretty appalling, some of them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So we start with those. And then we realize, in fact, uh, that there are some African tales when they arrive in the Caribbean, they fuse some of Perot's tale, but also some of the Grimm's tale. Well, because, and as close as all that is, there's probably some back and forth. Like, if you go back far enough, some of those tales had moved from one place to another. We had a scholar on who uh, said they'd been trying to discover where the tar baby originally came from. And the scholars that study it have no consensus, like, uh, uh, like they still debate it today. So, you know, maybe it kind of circulated before, but certainly there's a strong echo between uh, Bluebeard, uh, the French folktale, and then uh, the African folktale about a, you know, a woman who's wanting to, I guess, marry above her station. Um, yeah, uh, I think the, the main difference is Blue, Bluebeard is, you know, like, she's young, she's pretty, and Bluebeard, as shiny thing, is, is rich. And she's poor. So that's already a little uh, annoying commentary on, on young women. In the African tale, she's young, she's defiant, she doesn't want to listen to her parents. So, so you, you do have connections. I really think that those tales are made, there's two levels. You could see the patriarchal version like, oh, if you don't listen to your parents, something bad is going to happen to you. But then there's also another layers where the tale is also a warning to young women, like, hey, marriage can be dangerous if you right. don't pick the right person. So, well, yeah. Once you get to the new world, and certainly in Louisiana, um, you get the racial aspect, you know, the, the upper class white man, he's not your friend, you know, he's, he's all hot for you now, uh, but he's not going to be in a formal marriage, there may be some kind of plissage arrangement, yeah, but yeah. he's going to love you and leave you at the very best. Uh, the cautionary, it's a cautionary type tale. It's not leaving yes. you on the hook in the basement. <clears throat> but, but that's why the tale is about marriage. Because mm -hmm. in reality, they don't marry you. But then there's right. still this aspiration. If they marry you, you eat. You know, if it's kind of weird uh, capital, you know, like, if you marry, you know, a white man, and in the Martinican tale, it's really clear because it's all about colorism, because the right. young woman hates all, you know, like dark-skinned black people, particularly okay. her brother. She has a very dark brother that she hates, but he comes at the end and save her. So again, mm. you know, the story is coming, and she refusing everyone. She refusing people from a, you know, her own standing mixed race people, light skinned people. No, she wants a white man with blue teeth who eventually is the devil. So uh, I think <laughs> Stephen is, is, is right to say, and you too, uh, you know, it's yeah. most tales when they're adapted in the Americas, they talk about race. So they, they're not simply talk about, you know, how defiant a woman is, you, you need to, uh, you know, marry in, uh, in your community, but they're also like, hey, if you think you're too good, because you're beautiful and you're light skinned and you just want to marry, you know, above your station, you're going to marry uh, the devil. So that, right. that's, that's kind of interesting. So many, and it's all about social commentary, really. In, in Louisiana, that ties in with the whole uh, tragic mulatto theme uh, that you see uh, in that period of time where, you know, a mixed race, especially usually a woman, especially usually young and beautiful and, 
she's got these impossible choices, like is she going to remain kind of uh, crushed down under the weight of the uh, racist system we have, or is she going to try to get with the white guy? And then that brings its own set of problems. So- um, Cutting off her own culture, you know, right. her own people, I mean, her own family, most immediately. Exactly. So, you know, that's, that shows us, <laughs> that's why I like those stairs and I show them uh, in my classes, because to show that, you know, how colonization and colonialism has been impacted intimacy and relationship mm -hmm. between people. And those stairs show it's really like in Maya's job or all the version, the defiant girl who doesn't want to marry whoever, she cuts herself from a family. If she wants right. to have some social capital, if she wants to climb, she has to leave the family. So as Stephen said, you have a travel log where she literally leaves the family mm -hmm. to the spa spa speciality, to the space. Or we could think about her going up where she's going to leave her family to marry no more bourgeois or rich. Mm -hmm. But then she has to literally deny them. She has to reject them because, you know, she has to, and then means she has to reject blackness to embrace whiteness. But we know how this works, because at the end of the story, no matter what, the devil is after her. And then <laughs> it's the dark, dark brother who comes to save her, reminding yeah. her, hey, you know, you need to be connected to your roots. So this, this variant uh, of, of, of the tale is amazing. You know, when you read like uh, one scholar had like 78 variants that he found in one country alone, I was like, wow. Uh, and you know, when it's Africa, it's more about marriage without uh, within your community. You should not leave your community. When that tale comes in the US, then you have all the racial uh, elements, right. but it's still very gendered. Yes, uh, race and gender are so important at that period. Well, and I'm thinking about Chaucer too. Remember back to your Chaucer, the medievalists have gone and traced those stories. I'm thinking particularly like Shauna Clear and Pertolo and some of the others, they've traced those things back. Some of those stories not only have, you know, they, they, they have a source, but they have analogs. I think one of them has an analog in India or Afghanistan or someplace. And, and, and the last place you would think that a story, you know, one of those Chaucerian stories would have, but no, it's got an analog in that part of the world. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild where they have there are these similar types of tales but they're not you know again they're, they're from different sources but they they work out very similarly but th think about it you know if like folk tales are telling us about social identities and how they're constructed it's normal that you find the same ones but then at the same time you know we all have read our bibles you realize that there were nomads people were traveling and some right. of the tales we, we we some of the tales we have nowadays they are coming from the Bible, but some of them can be connected to India and other places. Right. So you know, I really I think I think someone needs to do some research, but see how doing you know when the Bible was put together, how those nomads or those tribes were traveling, and maybe they, they heard you know stories from India, and and then those tales are being revamped. So that's why, you know, the idea of origin, like Edouard Glissant said, you know, like the racine unique, you know, like you have only one root, might not be the best thing. Maybe the idea to think that, hey, there's several roots everywhere. Right. But, and then roots, you know, or roots, you know, like for the tree or when, you know, you, 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 you take a big route to go uh, somewhere, is this idea that everything travels, People do not seem to travel, but it's amazing to see how far folktales can travel. Mm -hmm. And you think of Jesus living in Nazareth as being kind of a backwater, but it was kind of on the interstate of the day. It was right. Yeah, near it was a crossroads, wasn't it? It was right near the Mediterranean. The 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 camel uh, caravans would come in from the east, and uh, you know there was also a north-south axis. If you wanted to get from Syria down to Egypt, and this is the way you did it, um, and so it was, uh, it, you know, it wasn't as isolated as we might think. It, it was exactly. a crossroad. It was a major crossroad. Yeah, it was a yeah, it certainly was. So I wanted to mention we had a recently a genealogist Jari Anara who uh, talked about. <laughs> reconnecting people to their past. Like he said, 
it's not unusual to get a call from somebody in California that has a kind of vaguely familiar last name and they're just trying to do research on their family because they don't know any, because a couple of generations ago, the family moved out there, had to pass in order to gain the mm -hmm. uh, social capital of whiteness. But then that meant they were cut off from their family. And here are these kids that really don't know who they are um, because they've lost touch, you know, and all of a sudden they've got maybe a huge Creole family waiting for them back in New Orleans that they never knew about. Exactly. You know, like 20, uh, 23 and me, this, this thing is the best thing, but it's also scary because suddenly you realize like, oh, wow, really? And, you know, <laughs> you see all the all of your ancestors and sometimes they are not who you think you are. Right. Some people have had bad surprises or discovers brothers and sisters that didn't know because they were all in that thing. So I really believe that the idea of genealogy, when we think about folktales, when we start digging, we realize, oh, it's way more complicated than what we think. Mm -hmm. A lot of things has been cut, as you said, because the minute that uh, an individual decide to pass, all, you know, there's a, literally a heritage of culture that will disappear too. But it's still in our blood if you if you do any right. kind of this, you know, yeah, it's still, you know, in our, and our blood. Stories are the same it. way as our yes. DNA, that we are a mix of all these things coming together. And uh, sometimes we don't have an, any clue how complicated the background is. Exactly. And, you know, there's a, there, I'm sure you've, you have this book too. It's like Cajun Folktale. I forgot the name of the author. I, I go that, I use also that in my class. So, because I compare the Creole folktale to the Cajun ones, and some of them are very similar. Uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, but some are more Creolized, meaning like they have more uh, Black heritage, and some of the Cajun, because uh, they came really uh, from those French peasant who you know moved first to Acadia and then got kicked out uh, by the British before they got in Louisiana. Uh, so some of the stories, you know, because I think Nelephant and Baleine, uh, this mm -hmm. one, you, you you find it also uh, in the Cajun one. That's so the it's elephant kind of in the whale, is that right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. I love that one. I love that one. Yeah, so well, and think, think, think also about you know the the Gilgamesh uh, narrative. I mean, that thing is older than the story of of Noah and the Ark, which means either that I mean this is and this is so complicated in biblical story, biblical studies, which Bruce and I both did in, in seminary. But either Noah was based on the Gilgamesh story, or they're both coming from the same source, which is even older than both. Uh, exactly. And that's, you know, and uh, who, who, who knows? I mean, really, it's, I don't know that it's all, it's ever been very conclusive as to what's really going on there, other than they're both really ancient stories and they seem to be pretty similar in a lot of respects. You know, so that's why I'm telling, you know, like, no matter what your uh, religious affiliation, I was in my, my students, you have to read the Bible, I don't care. Uh, because yeah. you won't understand some of the stories we have and you won't understand the format of the story. <clears throat> if you don't know the stories in the Bible. And I say the same, if you have a Koran, read your Koran, because mm -hmm. they're all about stories, stories to enlighten the mind, to scare the people, because you know, at, at the time people were not educated the same way. And this is how through the stories, you will be learning a lot of things. And then when we look at the stories, we can see different elements of a particular community, because the same story, the same framework is going to be a little bit different because the lesson needs to be uh, distinct for a particular group. But you know, the one with the, the whale, I love this one uh, because it, I'm like, wow, where this is coming from? So as I said, my, my research is very interdisciplinary. So I looked at Acadian, Acadian folktales um, because Patricia Moiseau and Raphael Confiant, when they created their uh, movement of Creolité, they also um, got inspired of some work by Antonine Maillet, uh, which is, you know, a, a woman from uh, uh, Nova Scotia, which used to be uh, old Acadia. And the way she writes in old French is similar to our Creole. 
So when you look at all those texts, you, you could also see, uh, you know, a, an echo of uh, the kind of French Creole that you have in Louisiana. And as I told my, my students, a, there used to be a difference between Louisiana and Creole coming from, you know, we the uh, people from um, Saint-Domingue and then the Cajun French Creole. Right. But now it's, you know, it's, it's a mix. People forget that those used to be two different strands. Is there any uh, similar tale, uh, say, from the, the Spanish-speaking part of the New World? In other words, like, say, from Cuba or from, you know, anywhere in South America. Have you ever heard of anything like, like this uh, story that maybe made its way into, we'll say, into Argentina or made its way into Cuba or made its way into, you know, anywhere in Latin America? Well, no. Uh, I read the, uh, the short stories of Lydia Cabrera. Uh, you know, who's a Cuban, uh, she used to be a kind of ethnograph and, and, you know, she was from Cuba and she collected uh, Cuentos Negros, all the tales uh, by, a lot of tales by, you know, the uh, Afro-Cuban at the time. Their tales are wild. It's in English too, so it's very interesting, but they were very, the one I read were very different and they were more grounded in uh, Santaria. Uh, it's like some of the tale I read from Haiti, they were more gr grounding in voodoo. Do you see what I mean? It's kind of interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I don't find, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I don't find the tales, uh, the variants of Mayash Jab. I found this one, as I said, in West Africa. So you have it in Mali, uh, you have, you know, and then I found it in Martinique, Guadeloupe and other uh, island, uh, British island, and then in the US. But then the Spanish islands, I did not find it there. So, so I'm always wondering if it's because, you know, they were not recorded, we could be the trick. Uh, what's interesting is to remember that countries with Catholicism will have a kind of similar tales. So that's mm -hmm. why I think we found all those tales, you know, in Martinique, Guadeloupe and Louisiana, because we do have a strong uh, Catholic heritage there. Uh, and then, of course, slave will you, uh, move from plantation to plantations. So I think even then, we've, within the U.S., they will car uh, carry some tales. But Stephen, you 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 know you you ask a particular. It's a good question, and I have to say, at least for the tales uh, I did, you know I studied from Cuba, I didn't find uh, a story similar like Maya's Jab. And it's only recently because you know when you do a kind of very interesting interdisciplinary work uh, and you do okay French English and then Spanish thing and you're like oh and then I read I'm like and I read French text in French talking about many variants of you know the the, the girl who doesn't want to marry whoever and then I found the same in English I'm like yes connection mm. and then I found <coughs> this in uh, um, so someone was explaining that in uh, the uh, Indian Ocean, in uh, where you have also the Malgash, uh, Malagasy, you have the same tale. So I think French colonization has done something with that. And because you know, as as we, we explain, it's this tale is similar to Bluebeard and similar to some of you know the tale in West Africa. So I think sometimes particular tales survive because it's easy to connect with them and to uh, appropriate them. Do you see what I mean? So, so Yeah, there's something about the tale that may be resonating not only with the teller, but with the listener. Ex exactly. So, you know, I suppose like when some people from West Africa arrived in Martinique or in Louisiana and heard, you know, a white Creole, a white, uh, you know, um, colonist, tell uh, Bluebeard, Charles Spiro Bluebeard, they're like, ooh, <laughs> yes. Well, and you even wind up like uh, with um, the Tar Baby, that makes the jump over into Native American stories. Exactly, like, yes. Uh, we have a story on our website, a version, I can't remember which tribe, but you know, uh, the, the rabbit shows up with a drunk Frenchman. <laughs> And it's kind of obvious that the story was translated out of a French language or, you know, Creole, French Creole, and then they put their own spin on it. So uh, if you've got a good story, it'll circulate. 
or it makes its way in modified form on into yeah. the page or, in, or onto the screen in Looney Tunes as Bugs Bunny. Right. I mean, that's that is the that is that we learned that in a in that Chaucer class, you know, that I took with Bob Young when years ago, wow. and he he was saying that the 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 Beast Fable survives today in the form of Bugs Bunny, Mickey Mouse, all this these di different kinds of you know they're commercialized. Uh, but you can see the, the the skeleton of the original if you look closely enough. And you exactly. didn't have to, they're old, so you don't have to play royalty. So yeah, they're great. Um, I wanted to get to the story specifically of uh, Maya <laughs> job and uh, the Forche version of it. Um, I'm better with the English translation uh, than the. I've looked at the uh, Creole, but I'm as bad as my French is, my Creole is even worse. But um, in our version, there's a pretty young girl who's too, who's very proud and she wants to marry a guy. So they put a pumpkin up on a pole and whoever can get the pumpkin off the pole will win. And to her delight, it is uh, Maya's job. And um, he's all handsome and well-dressed and off they go to, uh, to his house. But Along the way, everybody they meet says, oh, well, I loaned you that beautiful hat and I'm ready for it back. And so he turns out not to be rich at all. And I was wondering what you make of that, like uh, the guy who's borrowed everything. <laughs> so let me tell you, in the West African stories, as I told you, the devil borrowed body parts of other animals. So along the way, he has to give the body parts back. And at the end of it, then, da da the the devil is revealed so i think and which is the beauty of it that this is a transposition that you know <clears throat> as Stephen talked about this idea of masquerade you're going to take body mm -hmm. parts or take clothes to pretend to be someone but the pretense cannot last forever and then you know all those uh kind of signs and that's a beauty because it's almost a kind of semiology literally like you're looking for signs telling you this person is rich, this person mm -hmm. has power. And then along the story, those signs are going to disappear quick, showing you that first, you don't know how to read. You don't uh -huh. know how to read the signs to get the rich guy because right. you're a young girl with no ideas and you don't, uh, you know, you don't pay attention to the correct uh, signs. Well, so, I've heard people say Donald Trump plays a rich man on TV, and uh, a lot of people mistook that for actual wealth, but apparently he doesn't, you know, a lot of it is just show, you know, he's learned how to put this. But we're all doing it. Think about it. Uh, you know, you're going to have a, a dude with a big truck, but then, I mean, literally his mortgage is the truck. Uh, so this is what I tell people, suddenly it's like, you know, you have people... You, you see them well-dressed, but they don't have money, they have debts. <laughs> right, right, right. And, 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 and I think also this is what the stories are about. They're telling you, be care careful about appearance. Because, you know, being rich, well, I used to be in Kentucky before coming here, and I still remember going to a polo match. Someone invited me because I was like, there's no way on earth I will go to. But it was very interesting. And then I saw this woman, she, I mean, she, she had like rubber boots, and like a kind of drab dress. And then someone told me, oh, you know, no, she, no, no, she's very rich. She's the one sponsoring all of that. She has a lot of horses. I was like, dang. So- She doesn't have to worry about how she looks because she's got no. all the money, right? Yes, and everyone knew, so she didn't care. Uh, so, I mean, those tells, but they tell something also about our community, which is sad. And, and when I say community, I could even say country, like money is king. We all pursuing things and it's a vain pursuit. And in all those tales, it's what it shows is like, if you're looking after shiny things and you don't pay attention, but look, in all those tales, the devil people around the young girl are always telling her, you know, there's something fishy about him. I don't feel him. In one of the story, the Martinican one, uh, someone just stick a little needle in the finger of the devil and then purse is going out. That's a big sign. Yeah, that's a bad and, sign. Yes, and she's still not listening. So, right. yeah. I mean, so, otherwise you wouldn't have a story, but. 
that's the point the story is really telling us what a society value or doesn't value uh but the, i mean the upside of that is also how can a young woman find uh, agency because at the end of the day she's right. like hey i don't care i will do what i can for myself so you could flip the story and realize that young women have understood that if they want agency and be free they need to find a rich dude Right. The currency she has is her youth and her beauty, and she has to make the best deal she can with it. I mean, in the, as you say, capitalist society that we live in, uh, that's the currency she has. Where Today, she might have other options, like if you, can be a, if you can be a doctor, why have to marry a doctor? You know, you, you can go do it yourself, and then you don't have to take care of some jerk. I, I totally agree, but, you know... I in a way, I'm also like more cynical because, you know, when you go to TikTok or you have, what is it, fan, there, there's a lot of social media thing when you will see this reenactment of, you know, beautiful women. And, and I tell my students, for me, it's no judgment. It's your body, you want to sell it and you get the money for yourself, great. Uh, well, then sometimes they'll come on and do the before and after, like this is me without the makeup and this is me with the makeup. And it's almost the same as Maya's job um, that um, he has put on basically makeup and fancy clothes and uh, he's presenting a, a version of himself that's not real. Um, and then the old it, illusion versus reality trick. Yes. Yeah. And the closer she gets to home, his home, the more himself he looks. And by the time he gets there, he, hands are off to his mother. And I wanted to talk about the mom, the, yes. mm -hmm. the, the mother-in-law's role in all this. because She kind of saves the girl's life. So what do you make of her role in this that she would side with the uh, beautiful bride rather than her uh, jerk of a son? Yes. So the mother is not there in the West African stories. In the West African stories is even the brother of the, of the girl or an, another sister. So it seems that the, the mother appears in the newer versions in the Americas. And it's kind of, but then this is how I realized the, the Creolized version maybe are more about women empowerment, meaning, okay, yeah. you know, like, okay, you made a mistake, but another woman is going to help you out. So that's why, you know, I kind of like those tales because they can be read in different ways. You could decide right. the tale is just there to mock the girl or just to give her some, you know, solace. Like if something bad happened to you, another woman is going to help you. And then if you realize also that the devil's house says something about a tense, scary, dark intimacy, the house is not a home. Uh, right, right. And it's really the mother in, you know, the mother-in-law is just like, hey, I'm going to help you get out. And it's, and it's all different stories that Ansel and Gretel, when the mother-in-law is like, hey, we're going to lose the kids in the forest. <laughs> the nickel just fell with this, but did you see that movie Get Out a few years ago? No, 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 I refuse to see that, that's no. But I knew that would be, uh, I saw a trailer, I'm like, no, I, that's, that's going to be too traumatic, <laughs> but yes. The genders are reversed, but the young, handsome black man goes home with his girlfriend and he's got his friend online because we have modern technology now and every little strange things that happens, he tells his buddy and the buddy's always like saying the same thing, dude, get out. <laughs> <laughs> dude you gotta get out uh these white people they're gonna kill you um uh, and uh I, I don't know i think there may be a kind of a connection uh between this story and that movie um is the then, angst uh, you know is the fear uh is the fear of the unknown space when you're trying to better your life those you know if you think about it this tells is a big letdown you have this girl like yay i found my man or in get out yay i found my beautiful girlfriend or whatever fiance and then you change spaces so i will go back to steven's you know travel log which is very interesting you're not in your space right right and you in this very that's why i don't see it because i, I get very claustrophobic about things so and i feel those things very like intensely and i realize you know so you go and even you know in the u.s all of us sometimes we go to a space and we're like oh i should not be here and no. 
And what stories they do that? Maybe the American context, it's the fact that for many slaves moving into a new place, they don't have their family to take care of them. And so they have to have what we call a found family, you know, the family of the people that are already there in this situation. And so the mom is almost more like, you know, a fellow slave in this situation who's going to look after her um, in this terrible, uh, you know, the terrible spot she finds herself in. But there are people who are willing to help you out in that. Yeah, and this is what I tell my students, you know, during COVID, everyone was like, well, we're still well doing, we're still in it. Um, let's have the early stages. Um, at, at one point, all students were traumatized and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do a little dance routine. I'm going to teach you a dance because it was a, a course about Francophone cultures. And I did um, a dance routine about a traditional dance from Martinique. And then, uh, which was ballet, which, you dance to the drum and you know and then i make connections to other dr um, drum dances and music that you will find in haiti and other places you still and I have those in new orleans on sundays at uh, congo square oh I, I, I need to go i need to go yes and, and this is what i meant to my students i meant you know what i'm not going to talk about resilience because i hate that term i will talk about thriving in darkness yes Yes, yeah. and, and flourishing and flourishing. Yeah, and flourishing despite every or in spite everything else. And so I'm telling them, I'm like, some particular groups, and I was talking about enslaved Africans, they've endured a lot and they're still here. They created mm -hmm. beauty, they created music. And you could think the same about, you know, the Acadian who left uh Nova Kosia pushed by the British, they arrived in uh, you know, Louisiana and they created Cajun culture. There's something about the, the human, you know, humanness, human being and creation and creativity. So sometimes we're all about the text. That's why I like old tradition and I like music to show my students. Sometimes this is what you have. You have your body and a beat, you will thrive. You have your voice, you will tell stories, you will thrive. And so I really believe that through those stories of the music, this is how we've been able to still be here, despite the technology. <laughs> right, right. I wanted to talk about the, the way she gets out, and partly it's um, magic eggs. You get six dirty eggs from the hen house. And what's the thing with eggs in folk tales? Because they do pop up a lot, and specifically in this one. Well, uh, so. I think you, you, you do have uh, some connections with uh, Charles Pierrot. Uh, I don't know if you read, uh, what's, it's the, oh, yes. So this one in French is Podan. In English is uh, Donkey Skin. So it's a beautiful, and it's all about incest. Great. Uh, so, it's this, <laughs> so it's this beautiful woman. Uh, uh, perfect she, story for Louisiana. That exactly, you know. So. Beautiful queen, she's beautiful, she married a beautiful king, she dies, and she tells her husband, you can marry anyone because I want you to find love, but she has to be more beautiful than me. Yeah, she didn't want him to marry anyone. All right, right, <laughs> and right. then he looks at his daughter and she's like, oh, she looks, she's more beautiful than my wife, so let's do it. So of course she, she escapes because she's like, no. And in the whole story, it was, she had, uh, it was acorn. She had acorns in the story and she could, uh, you know, she had a, a fairy godmother giving her acorn and then she would just throw up, she would throw one and then have a beautiful dress of things, magical things. Uh, well, and the thing about like a magic bean or acorn or egg, they all grow into something else. Exactly. And they have a beginning of something, if you think about mm -hmm. it, you know, so, and, and I'm sure there's, you may have like African origins from the egg or their kind of maybe locally things. In Martinique, uh, we said that it's not zombies, but there's some evil spirit that you can grow out of an egg. Never try that. But, you know, I heard stories about it. You just bury the egg, let, let it there for, so, you know, do a prayer and then come back and then, you know, break the egg and then you have an evil spirit that will do whatever you want. So, so there's a lot of magical element uh, around the egg, and that could be also an heritage of some 
African of West African uh, origin. But I think it depends in, in one of the African story of a girl, she was throwing, I think it was, it was in Africa, so it was not an acorn, but she was throwing something. And then, you know, out of this, it was some kind of nut. Out of a nut, a river will come out then uh, because she, she was pre preventing the devil to come after her. And then you will have a big mountain. So there's always those tiny, as you say, element that you crack open and then ta-da, something new. Well, then I, I the wanna go back to what you were saying about the, you know, the body. And if you have the body and you have a bait then you can thrive and you can flourish. And, and we were talking about, you know, relating this to cultures that are not, and I hate to use this term, but they're not literate in the Western sense. Uh, they, they don't read and write. And this reminds me of a comment that a, actually my advisor at one point in, in uh, library science school, he was an old Peruvian guy who had gone to Michigan and I think Harvard for his doctorate. But anyway, he was a librarian and very steeped in a lot of Latin American type stories, folklore, et cetera. And he was saying, we talked about this very thing one day. He said, how do we measure literacy in the Western world? And a few people kind of were on the right track. Finally, somebody says ability to read and write. He said, that's correct. But he said, how would you do it somewhere else where there's no, you know, there's not any kind of literacy like we understand, say, in the U.S. or Canada or someplace like that. And nobody could come up with an answer. And finally, he said, you tell stories or you dance or you play music or you build things in a certain way. In other words, your architecture, like folk architecture, or you cook, you know, you cook and serve food. And all of those means or th those vehicles are means by which a culture that doesn't read and write perpetuates itself and they before perpetuate themselves um, through all of those methods and this was an old librarian telling us this before the printing press uh the peasant in europe would read the stained glass windows in the church you know it was something they it, it's a kind of a communication device you know you can yep. hear the seven stations of christ uh yes you know and that kind of stuff and so it it, it um it well literacy comes from the word letter. So, you know, literally it would have, you know, some kind of uh, alphabet, but uh, there are other kinds of literacy. That's why exactly. I talk about signs, uh, you know, like with my students it's very important. Uh, you know, I, 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 I talk to them about artifacts. I don't talk to them about, you know, like what is an artifact is created by human. So anything can be an artifact. So right. a text can be an artifact, but a dance, a song is also an artifact because I, I want them to 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 get away, you know, to from the idea of literacy. And we see it. That's why Edouard Glissant, using an uh, I think an Asian kind of term, talk about oraliture, which is oral literature that he puts mm -hmm. together to try to give back uh, to orality the the you know lettre de noblesse. But but again, if you think about the sign then a sign can be anything it doesn't need to be written. It needs to be deciphered. Dance, right. and as you know, a lot of traditional dances or what we call traditional dances, they're, they're very regimented and, and you know, and codified. So you need to, uh, to know the, the code and you need to know the signs. And when you dance to drums, you have to listen to the, the drum because it's like, you know, this call and response. So there's always a kind of dialogue. And I liked what um, Stephen said about this idea that, you know, dance is also about how to educate people. Yeah, you know, and music, yeah. music is a and fine, music, I mean, yeah, and music one, yeah, one of our yeah. professors at, at Louisiana Tech, when Bruce and I were undergrad, he was a musicologist and he was a box scholar. And he said this, we were talking about tunes, various melodies, that is to say, uh, that he would say, you know, some of these uh, may have come from what are you know countries in what is now Africa or the continent of Africa but also in Europe and he used an example he was an old jazz um, not only a classical you know a fiddler but he was also a jazz a jazz fiddler he said how many of you've ever heard the old tune Streets of Laredo well most hands in the room went up and he said that is an old tune that goes back to old Scotland but it's been retooled many many times to make it into a you know a kind of a western sort of you know country western kind of a piece but it goes back to Scotland so it's, and it's an old tune that goes back probably before the Renaissance, you know, maybe the late middle ages sometimes. So it's hundreds of years old, that is to say, but yeah, I, different, yeah, different listeners 
hear it and they retool the thing like we were talking about these stories something about the tune or the story or whatever resonates with the listeners or with the teller and then they you know they, they modify the thing exactly and i'm going to say something appropriate i think copywriting has doomed us yeah. um because the minute you start to copyright a lot of things but anywhere you've learned somewhere else you know because music is always and also writing and also dancing you know is always it's dynamic yeah yeah, you know, you, you get inspired by something else. So it's never totally yours, it's ours. And then we forget all the, the heritage coming from, you know, a long you, time ago. Do you remember that song, Who Let the Dogs Out? Yes. Who Let the Dog? There is a documentary on YouTube. It's either 30 minutes or an hour where they go back one layer at a time. It's like peeling an onion. And okay, this group they made it famous all of a sudden everybody in the world knows the song but before them there was this group and they said well we're getting it stolen from us you know and then there was a group before them and then there was a group before them and that and I only lasted about 20 minutes and I never did find out who let the dogs out <laughs> 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 it it there was just always another <clears throat> layer yes and, and, you know, so that's why I tell my students, we should be humble, at least, I, I, you know, I can be vain, sometimes arrogant, but I still try to be humble because whenever I'm like, oh, that's, a, that's my idea. It's not a, my idea. Sometimes I may have read it somewhere and I forgot or I heard <laughs> something somewhere. So that's why sometimes I believe you. And if an, agree, an idea is great, you may have two people having the same idea, you know, on different sides of the globe. Yeah. If you're going to steal an idea, make it somebody obscure. I was talking to uh, one of my fellow professors, Dr. Youngman, about a notion I had in the back of my head. And he said, oh, yeah, that's Nagy. And it's like the most famous guy that's written on Achilles in the last uh, 30 years. And Oh, and I'd read the book and I'd forgotten, you know, and then when he, I went back and looked, oh, there's where that idea came from. Um, it had gotten separated from you know, the source, uh, just the idea was still floating around. Yeah, you know, because it works. you've been dig digesting it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that's why I say sometimes copyright is right because there's too many people stealing stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, as cold as we know, you have people who just going to go on a rampage on people's dissertation or, you know, obscure articles without citing them. I, I believe in citation. You have I to do, And I felt really bad that I had forgotten about <laughs> But the thing, at the same but, time, you forget. We forget. We 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 human. You know, I've you can never have... forgotten that one again. I always okay. This is Nagy. Go here. You know, uh, he's actually put his book online so my students can read it for free. But um, yeah, I just remember having forgotten that uh, that the, and it made me look like I was still. But we read so much as scholars that after oh, no. a while, yeah, it's like I've told students. I said <clears throat> that it's almost like watching a parade, and you're going to remember the most compelling or the most arresting floats that go rolling by, or or maybe somebody on horseback or whatever. But you're probably not going to remember every you know every single float. Exactly. Uh, and they finally they finally just flow into one big mass. <laughs> frankly, <laughs> exactly. But you know, so it's the same with folk tales. There's, you know, there's better version than others. And sometimes those versions, you know, because we do also my students, we do the Disney versions. And I'm like, oh no, you have to read the original because Disney, mm, I love, I mean, it's like, you have to read the original well, dream. And we are not original because they stole no. that from peasants anyway. So <laughs> even Aesop probably didn't make up those stories. He probably exactly. wrote, them and wrote them down, you know? Yes. <laughs> there is no original uh there may be the earliest we have recorded there's certainly that but yeah and i like this idea of we you know when you say recording it and putting something down so this is what i tell my students folk tales when they start being written suddenly they start being the uh, you know ownership is to men they become like masculine writing though a lot of the storytellers were women and you know they will tell this to other women of the kids so i i was like you have to think about folk tales as also a role, uh, you know, history, oral uh, culture, and literature. Even if what we read right now is written, thinking that there's different version of a tale, but then just wonder why someone has 
chosen a particular version because they want to carry a particular idea. Right, right. Yeah, and the idea can change over time about what it carried, you know, what, it, what is this story telling us? And, you know, it's telling us a different thing when the rich groom actually is as poor as everybody else. He's just borrowed everything. You know, that's a different spin on from Bluebeard, the original back in France. I wanted to talk and get her home and uh, talk about the horse because uh, she comes up to a horse that previously she had told her mother, let the horse die, who cares? And now she sees the horse and says, oh, will you please take me home? And he's, didn't you tell me that I could just die? Who cares? Okay, well, get on, I'll take you home. And maybe it's kind of a, I don't know, like Dorothy, when she gets back to Kansas, there's no place like home and all this stuff she didn't care about before and seemed so dull and drab and was ready to get away from. Now she's so glad to get back. And I mean, do you see that in this, uh, this version of the folk tale that we're focusing on? Yes, totally, because, and again, as I said, it's inspired also from the West African tale, where it's not a horse, it's a brother of a sister saving her. And most of the time, she has mistreated, so what I forgot to say, like the brother most of the time will have a disability or will be very ugly or, you know, tales sometimes are so cruel. Or, or very dark skinned. Exactly, <laughs> or deformed, or, or, you know, like it will be bad for her. And at the end, it's this supposedly like abject character who comes to save her. So I think in the particular story we're talking today, when you have a transposition, <laughs> then it's not a brother deformed or whatever, it's a horse. But, she, but see, the structure is the same because she's still out of spite, have been mean to the, the animal. In the Martinican story, she's mean to a brother. Right. Uh, and there, there's three versions I know. In one version, the brother is too dark. So she's very mean to, to him, which is nice. In another version, the brother uh, has a limp. So, you know, he doesn't right. work right. And in another version, he's ugly. I'm not sure what ugly means there. Uh, of course, in, in our societies, being dark skinned is a handicap, you know, by the way that uh, it, it works against him and him trying to uh, get ahead in life. Well, and, and the story, so that's why I like the stories and it's all about colorism. It, it makes clear, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's an imbalance and the story tries to make the balance right. But as a community, we still have a lot of work to do to really back up the idea that black is beautiful. Uh, you know, this is what we say, mm -hmm. but sometimes light, light skinned people will have because it's all about beauty. And this is what I tell my students, the idea of beauty is a social capital and in right. different countries is expressed in different ways. So in Martinique, for instance, beauty is also light skin, but it's also long hair. You have to have long straight hair. And even if technically your face is not that pretty, then you're beautiful. <laughs> right, right, right. So uh, beauty is another problem. And you could see in this tale that the storyteller is trying to grapple with that, like you're beautiful, but you're just mean and you're, so what, how could we make you a better, a better person and appreciate the people uh, around you? And it's interesting when you start talking about beauty to students, because I had students from Malaysia telling me, because you know, they're brown and some people are really dark in there. And one of her told me that her auntie gave her, you know, a nice little cream to get lighter. And she was so offended. I was like, oh, I'm like, what? So it's not, you know, it's not simply quote unquote black people having problems in, you know, in uh, American society. All the, this idea of colorism is not simply grounded in colonialism. It's really like a lot of different countries, well, lighter I mean, skin. The same countries that conquered the new world conquered that area of the world too. And skin was, uh, a passport there as well. So lighter was better for them. So I'm sure they have the same kinds of creams we have here. You know, it gets into like the internal racism of uh, the um, African diaspora that kind of has been brought in, you know, absorbed from the general culture um, that people within the community can be prejudiced against each other. It's about power at the end of yeah. the day. Yeah. Because, you know, 
Uh, and I think sometimes if you see it as power, you can find ways to make things better. So when I tell my students, it's like, if the social capital is light skin, beauty, and then you can have more advantages, then it's not so much simply self-hatred because it's literally the society telling you, you won't go anywhere. So you have to find ways uh, to, go, uh, to go beyond that. And right. it's about power. So again, if I go back to my discussion about the body, you have to find ways to use your body uh, in different or more efficient or powerful ways, which, which simply don't rely on beauty. Maybe you have to start using your wit. But again, with dance, right. I tell my students, with dance, you don't need to be beautiful. You need to dance well. Uh, and then dance is also a social capital, at least in the Caribbean and I'm sure your, your, your creativity or imagination. Oh, exactly. I mean, you could be quote unquote, the ugliest person on earth. If you're a great dancer, you're going to get with the girls. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, even if you look like all the bad things people think, you know, like, you know, if they think you're overweight because in, in our society, all of that is seen negatively in the world of the dance, none of that matters. So, so you have to create new spaces uh, where literally it's your abilities uh, to create. And again, you have people with disability will be great dancers too, because as Stephen says it's about creativity, what do you do with what you have in an unexpected way? I mean, look at somebody like Mick Jagger. He's never been what conventionally pretty, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he could sing and you know dance, and uh, you know he's he's been very popular with the ladies. I understand. Um, <laughs> yes, and again, it's about power. So you have to right. decide where the power is. Like you know, politicians. I, you know, I'm not going to say anything, but you are. You may see some politician on TV with beautiful wives, and you know they're not that all there themselves, because power power attract. So well, you remember power. what um, Henry Kissinger said that power is the ultimate aphrodisiac. <laughs> he, was, he was always exactly. dating beautiful women, even though he was kind of a, a froggy looking fellow. But, you know, he was right there with his, uh, you know, right in the White House uh, running foreign policy. So, yeah. Well, um, I mean, he in, in knew. And, and, but then you have to decide you know, where to get the power. And as I said, power could be Mick Jagger, then, you know, great uh, singer, or it could be a great dancer, or it could be political, you know, yeah. the political. Yeah, I'm thinking the political, like, like Boris Johnson right now. <laughs> Someone, I heard a, uh, yeah, yeah, I heard, exactly. I heard a, a Marxist economist the other day talking about him, and he said that Johnson's head, head has never met a hairbrush or something to that effect. And this guy was a Marxist, yeah, and he's just blistering Boris Johnson about never having met a hairbrush. <laughs> people are people are so cruel. People are cruel, but this is but, a, he's, this but he, is he's, a, he's 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 often seen with or has been seen with pretty you know what would be considered attractive women, and but he's also a hoodlum. I mean, he's a literal you know Johnson's a literal hoodlum you know, beating up women and this kind of thing. And, and again, so this is what I mean, power. So, you know, our society, so that's why, you know, when uh, 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 Bruce, you were talking about self-hatred, uh, we have to, I think, reverse it, looking at what society is doing and then we can work on ourselves being like, hey, or, you know, it's like, I'm okay, look at this person. It's just about the power they, they, they yield. So oh. what kind of power can I yield to get better in life we're all old enough to remember when uh beauty style for african americans and probably in other nations as well was very white based and then there was the black is beautiful movement and also the afro was in and you know uh that became the um the new uh, you know the, why would we want to straighten our hair our hair looks great. Don't you want to throw, you know, and uh, yeah, let's embrace who we are. So, so, so exactly that. So, you know, sometimes you don't have to go that far. You just have to have a, I really believe in the power of self-reflection. So sometimes you just have to go quiet somewhere and, you know, and it's not easy because, you know, sometimes when you, you know, when you first start having your hair natural, for instance, when no one else is doing it, everyone is looking at you weird, but then after a while you see more and more people doing it. So sometimes, you know, you just have to create a trend, be uncomfortable, but then people are going to be attracted to it because we, I think we all want to be 
fine in our own skin. Well, look at the whole debate over cornrows these days. That you know, it was a distinctly black uh, hairstyle, and now a lot of white women want it too because oh, that it really is attractive, and I want that. And then okay, but should you have that? <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I have a difficult conversation like that with my students because some of my students are, didn't, uh, you know, African American or African descent. Thought that was just annoying because, you know, as a black woman, if you have cornrows and you go to particular jobs, then you're going to be discriminated against. But then if you have these white women with this kind of style, nothing happens to them. So right. then they're like, then they're like, so no, they should not wait because it means still for us, we cannot wait. Uh, so I could see their point, and you know this whole discussion about cultural appropriation, which is a very important one. Um, I always tell them, look for the money. For me, cultural appropriation is always about money, but in that case, yeah. it's social capital. If right. you get something out of that that I don't get with from my culture, you should not do it. But you know, if we all enjoying something, and but again, so that's why it's it's very. That's why I was talking about this idea of copyright. It's very difficult. I mean, we all eat Chinese. We all eat Indian. The way we dress sometimes is a fusion from different type of uh, you know cultures. So, oh, pizza is a good example of that. Pizza. I mean, my aunt was very Sicilian. Well, and and pizza not necessarily is Italian or even Sicilian. I mean, because there's apparently a precursor from the Greek world, but still, I mean, those foods like that come out of the Eastern Mediterranean. So, I mean, you know, what do you do with that? Uh, yes. So that's why I think we have to be always very careful about this idea of origin, uh, of ownership. Who owns something? Uh, in one hand, we want to make sure that particular groups are not being oppressed and that their creativity are not being taken away from them. I mean, think about, you know, Elvis Presley and rock and roll. <laughs> I mean, Little Richard started the whole thing. But, you know, uh, so that I understand because Elvis with his pelvic, you know, thrust got all the attraction. Whereas, you know, you have other uh, individual of African descent who started all of that, but they didn't get the money. So that's why right. for me, I start with cultural appropriation in a capitalistic sense of money, but then you have to think about also uh, social capital. Uh, do you get something, you know? And the hair, because I talked to a student, she's like, yeah, but see, she's going to wear the same hairstyle and she will go to work and no one's going to say anything to her. And I was like, hmm, I see your point. Uh, so in that case, it could be cultural appropriation. But again, for me, hairstyle, uh, it depends. I heard an interview, I can't remember the musician, he had written a song, he was a black musician and had written a song and there was a much bigger, more famous version that a white singer had sung and uh, they asked him, well, what'd you think about that, that version? And he said, oh, he wrote some powerful checks. <laughs> so, you know, he had gotten his cut, you know, and that made a difference to the way he saw it. Like, uh, okay. he. He's uh, paid me for being able to use this rather than just stealing it, which is the normal way of things. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, this is what I mean. Like, you could just pay the dues. You know, like you have Whitney Houston's, uh, you know, when she sings, I Will Always Love You, which is, uh, what's her name? Oh, my God. Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Yes, yeah, I mean, he, I love yeah, Dolly Parton. Dolly. Dolly. Yeah, she recorded it for sure. And I think she wrote the lyrics, too. Yeah, she yeah. Wrote I mean, I, lo I love uh, Dolly's version, but Whitney is the bomb. Uh, yeah, right. Whitney's got that voice. You know, and, and Dolly Parton, I think in an interview she said that, you know, Whitney has done a good job. So, you know, collaboration like that. But some people are uh, like Justin Bieber, for instance, he was talking about this uh, tropical pop. It's not tropical pop. It's like, uh, you know, a mixture of reggae and dancehall from Jamaica. He, he, he's taken some, you know, a bit to add to his music. And I remember seeing uh, again on YouTube, like musicians from Jamaica being livid. They were so mad <laughs> of a creation but Justin of Bieber is, Right, not come up in your mind when you think Jamaican artists, uh, music artists. Uh, but again, if you write the check, then that probably helps with the feeling some. Uh, were there any final thoughts about this story? Um, things that you've thought about it that we haven't had a chance to touch on yet? No, I think the most important thing was the layers. I think this story can be read in many, many different ways. Uh, I think that's important. And sometimes 
the, the left hand could be in, in, in the middle of the tail. And you know, your point about the horse, I think was very interesting. Uh, so it could be a story of redemption. How could you be a better citizen in your own community? <clears throat> it could be a story of spite. I mean, you, you're mean, we're going to punish you. Uh, but what's important with this tale is like, why do you have so many versions of this tale? And, and, you know, and I go back to a comment that Stephen said, like, I really believe that some tales will die and some will not. And you know, the, the fact that they're still with us says something about our society. Why do we still need those tales to tell us? Yeah, the stories it's still might, speaking. Yeah, the stories might not change that much, but the meaning may change quite a bit. I, there was this story that I don't know. I heard it about every other week in church growing up. It was a uh, one set of footprints in the sand. There isn't a, even a bad country song about it. God's walking beside me, and uh, I look at this particularly rough spot in my life, and there's only one set of footprints in the sand, and. I said, God, why did you leave me? And he said, oh, I didn't leave you there. I was carrying you. Well, uh, I was in church one day and this deacon got up and started <laughs> trying to tell the story. And he got to that part and he said, uh, you know, God, why didn't you leave me? And he said, I didn't leave you. You left me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He, he fixed wow. that story up good. Yeah, right. So uh, he just invented a new version right there, you know. And you were like, I don't like that version. <laughs> <laughs> you know that may be that may be intrinsic though to oral narratives and so a lot of these stories i'm thinking maybe the majority of them were I mean, again i go back to bruce and i studying this in seminary they were transmitted via oral narrative or by oral tradition i should say uh, you know if, if you go back and read bruce is it in luke's gospel but anyhow where the writer starts off and he said what we have seen and heard da, 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 da. Right. he's That's referencing and my, and my first greek professor at tech told me that he said he is referencing oral narrative explicitly when he says what we have heard he's talking about the stories the jesus stories that were circulating around you know ancient judea circa you know 40 you know uh, 80 40 or thereabouts or, or you know 80 of the common uh, the common era in other words and try um, as you might tell the story just the same way you're always going to introduce variations and that's how yeah. yeah like like that game tell is it telephone or whatever it's called right right uh, where we, we use it to illustrate the power. Oral, oral tradition what's that we have to think about the power of a storyteller i mean we've we've, we've yeah. spent a lot of time about stories but at the end of the day it's about the storyteller and the mm -hmm. storyteller, you know, like the archbishop in your story of a bishop, may decide just to change the story or the ending or do something because of the time or whatever the intent. So we always have to remember that the story we hear is only a variant, is only a version of right. a bigger, exactly. bigger pool uh, of stories. And us too, we can become storytellers. And I think suddenly we, we become a part of a bigger community of a bigger family sharing uh, all those stories. Yeah, and realizing these stories are meant to have a context. And like you said, uh, typically it would be maybe the mothers telling the kids at night and whoever. I, I remember when I was growing up, we would go to my grandmother's house and uh, Mother Spell would, uh, whoever was in the house uh, when it was bedtime, she would gather us all in a big circle and she would read a chapter of the Bible and she had a very monotone voice, which she made even more monotone. And by the time she finished, we were almost asleep anyway. Uh, but I could see that rather than let's read a chapter. If she couldn't read, let me tell you a story. And that's how those are passed down. Yes, and sometimes, you know, it's more and more difficult, but in my classes, I like to ask students, you know what, ask your mother or your grandmother or your grand grandmother is possible to tell you a story, like story that they may have heard when they were little. And it's interesting. One of my students from, was from Bolivia and he called his grandfather. And he told me a story that his grandfather told him. And he was like, oh my God, I never thought about asking my grandfather about stories. And because we live in a world like technology is all about stories though, but we forget the knowledge that our elders have. And we forget sometimes to ask our grandparents or parents, you know, like, oh, someone older. So what stories do you know? Well, our American culture is so youth centric and the idea of respecting the elders, um, 
that cuts against that grain. It's always what's the new thing, not what's the old thing. Yeah, but you know, I've, we all mature uh, <laughs> slowly, I hope. We, we realize, yeah, that's not working for us. Oh, I tell the same stories over and over all the time. My family just kind of rolls their eyes, you know, but they need to hear it. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, that, then, you know, when you, then they will remember. Now they may There's remember. a reason those things survive sometimes for, for millennia, like, like the stories of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian scripture. I mean, those things survive because they, you know, they educate the people, they inform the people, they inspire the people, they correct the people. They're serving all kinds of functions. Yeah, and sometimes it talks to our heart too. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's why some disappears, but those that, uh, that stay, you know, the stories that stay with us, as you said, they, they say something about us because yeah, they speak. And yeah, like they the, still speak. The original African context, you could see the theme of listen to your elders because they're wiser than you. Uh, and don't be so, uh, you know, sure of yourself and um th that uh it just seems like th that would be something that traditional culture would say okay listen to your elders you know and uh they may know something you don't yeah but you know when you look at uh green stales or you know payroll stales they're still very traditional it's just you know it's just like beginning of 20th century you forgot about all of that <laughs> the minute you know the minute we become more modernized so what i tell my students i'm like and um, we started with those stories for you to realize that this is our past but we used to be like this what we call traditional supposedly um uh, you know I, I i prefer traditional you know uh, you know but sometimes I don't like it because then you could oppose to civilized, but I don't, I hate basically, but you know, but literate and like, uh, because you know, it's like all of those opposition, but you know, we just cultured different ways. That's the like, whole thing. The enlightenment severs us like that. I mean, that's one of my areas is, is enlightenment. Exactly. And, enlightenment. and one of the reasons I studied it was basically to tear it apart <laughs> and to point out something like, like people were offering internal critiques during the enlightenment of where it was falling you know where it was failing and it severs us from the past it's you know if you if you can reinvent yourself why do you need the past why do you need tradition right why do you need any of these things when you're your own person and the problem with that is again is what we've been talking i mean you're you're severed from your own people from your own culture so it's a it's a kind of a dangerous idea to be honest back to the idea of roots you know what kind of tree will you have if it doesn't have roots and what kind of person do you have if they don't have roots um, it's a hydroponic tree and it's a, a, a you know a, a child created in a test tube or something maybe <laughs> but at the same time traditions can be dangerous if you don't change oh, yeah. them so it's, it's just finding the balance you know finding the balance of the connection of the past but also the willingness to change because we know the past because um, you know i'm sure you've been to meetings when people are like, oh, we're going to change this and that. I'm like, I thought you'd done that before. And then people look at the archives of a department and this was, you know, and we forget the memory of the archives of the department we're in. And I'm like, I don't want to keep on doing the same thing. So could we just, so I think knowing the past is important because otherwise we just. Oh yeah, we, we had this, um, that my English department, this writing contest that we've been doing for, about 10 years or so and nobody wanted to do it anymore everybody's tired of it and we were having a faculty meeting discussing well would it be possible to get along without the uh the writing contest i'm the old fart in the room i said well i was here for 20 years before we started it and we got by just fine and uh, <laughs> that was the end of the writing contest at least exactly and, you see what i mean like knowing the past can free us right we don't have to do it Everybody in the room, that's all they could remember. But I, you know, I remember when it started and I, I always found it a chore. Uh, we have so much to do. Yeah, you know? right. And more and more, less time, less resources, but more and more things to do. So we have to pace ourselves. And, you know, the kids were not really interested in applying for it and the professors weren't really interested in judging it. So, you know, it ran its course. It had, a, you know, we had a good 10 years of it and, uh, you have to let it go. Right. Let it go. Let it go. Yeah, let it go. And, and if you know the history, then okay, we don't have to have it. 
Well, I sure do appreciate you coming on our podcast. This has been great. Um, Thank you for the invitation. It was really fun. Have you written some books that our uh, listeners might want to pick up somewhere? Folk tales are really fascinating. So the books I've, I've written are not about folk tales per se, but they're about Caribbean literature. Uh, so the first one is Dangerous Creole Liaison, Nationalism and Sexuality um, in uh, Caribbean Discourses from- Oh, and it's got the sex right in it. Yeah. See, yes. Oh, and wait for the title of the second one, Sex, Sea and Self. Oh yeah. Because, you know, because at the end of the day, what, what I'm doing is you take the sign and for me, sexuality or sex is a sign about how we build particular, you know, social ideas or identities. And, and I think people can connect easily with that, with this idea of, of gender and see how in the Caribbean authors were dealing with race and gender in particular ways. So that, you know, you could see yourself in those authors, even if you don't, you're not from the Caribbean because it's just about, you know, humanness. How well, can we connect? Something they share with New Orleans, especially, is the idea of exotic sexuality. You know, that you can go there and have sex with people that don't look like the folks back home. And uh, wouldn't that be cool? But it's also threatening in a kind of weird way. Yes. And, and basically, that's why I've got those ti sexy titles. And then when you open the book, you clearly see that I'm against all of that. Uh, so, you know, there is a, a kind of critique of exoticism and just the kind of reification of, you know, Black women bodies. Um, because, I mean, we're more than a body. Uh, <laughs> right. But we're all doing it. So it's kind of interesting to see how students react to that, you know, the commod commodification of bodies, of particular type of bodies, beautiful bodies or bodies of colors uh, by, you know, uh, European people or white people and or men. So, and my writers are talking about that too, which is kind of interesting to realize that already, you know, in the 1920s, you had women who were like, yeah, you know what? I don't want this particular exotic vision of myself. Right. So, Right. So yeah. I think that's, yeah. So, so it's fun. So, but as I said, it's all stories for me because I look into intertextuality. When I was a little, I love folk tales and fairy tales. So I read a lot, a lot, a lot of them. And then, you know, so I look at novels uh, most of the time as representation of reality. It's not reality, but there's always, for me, the books I'm looking at, they're archives of our ideas. They'll, and if this is my se same approach when I look at folk tales with my students. It's, uh, it's, it reflects the social setting of the time. So that is real. Even exactly. if the folk tale is kind of, uh, you know, and our monsters always represent something about ourselves. Like um, uh, Maya Job uh, in our story representing somebody that puts on the front of being rich, but really isn't. And then in other versions, he might represent the danger of a really actually rich person that's not really your friend. You know, he's going to take you home and consume you. Exactly. Um, like, you know, and leave your skin on a hook somewhere uh, because uh, he's, you know, not really in there in it for a relationship. Exactly. And look about the skin. This may be another podcast, but you know, the character Sukunyan, uh, which is one of the spirit of the night in Martinique, but also Trinidad, which is kind of a flying uh, spirit or zombie or kind of a vampire. And they can take their skin off. Wow. And they, put, and, and they hang that. And then they, the spirit and they, they fly and they go to houses, that suck people's blood or energy. So this idea of the skin off, is also a, a motif that you found in a lot uh, of Caribbean tales. With the a thing that was related to like a werewolf or something that can change your skin from one thing to another. And these can just get away from the skin altogether, it sounds like. Yes, and, and that's the power of, you know, transformation, mm -hmm. uh, like the skin walker. And it's interesting to see that uh, in a lot of, tales by Afro descendants, there's this kind of- well, Like the Native Americans I was mentioning, like the, yes. the Navajo, I know that's a, and they typically are, and I'm thinking of one particularly like the, uh, I think the owl, 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's almost like the, is it the nightingale that is the bird that prefigures death or some sort of tragedy? Well, the owl is occupies a, a, a space that's, you know, where you, there's usually going to be something tragic and or evil that's going to happen. Exactly. Um, and those characters are horrific. You know, yeah, like, yeah. Union is not, you don't want to meet this person uh, or oh, as a person. During the day, it's a normal person. Most of the time, older women, see how those stairs are bad for women, uh, you know, about the older women. Obviously, you know, she's just not happy with her lives. So she would take a, a skin off at night and just go into people's houses, fly away as a ball of fire, and then, uh, you know, go into people's house and suck in. <coughs> yeah, so that's, those tales are so interesting. Right. So I remember growing up, um, my parents, my dad was a Baptist preacher and had a pretty extensive library. And one thing he had was those uh, two volume gray bound uh, Grimm's fairy tales. And sometimes if I was bored, I would take them because especially when I was young, the books I liked had pictures and all that and Dr. Seuss kind of stuff. And this was just text. There were no pictures in the book and uh, it wasn't in fun uh fun rhymes and uh, the stories were not always that fun either. Uh, it was a different kind of story, but it was like, wow, these are different. I mean, you're lucky because, you know, when I was little, I had storybooks of the Grimm's with pictures, bad idea. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. That could be worse. Yes, you know, like, because Cinderella, they cut the feet, you know, the, the stepsisters to put the feet in the, um, glass slippers so i was like yeah i'm not sure that the fairy tale is really designed for children at least uh, oh, no, they're not, they're not originally obviously not and was you know, a red riding hood a lot uh, you know to use a bad pun grimmer in the oh, original yeah, yeah because yeah. this one was you know about <laughs> sexual uh, sex, sexual assault so i was like so, you know when i saw when i teach that in class and my students are like wow what? So yeah, so talking about tales and telling things about, uh, you know, the society, uh, because you know, Peru was a little moral, and the moral is something like young women should be careful of the wolves uh, in the nice salons. Right, right, right. So, but you know, so we learn a lot, I believe, uh, with uh, with folk tales, but we still need to decipher them in the right fashion. Yeah, I mean, um, you were talking earlier about signs. Did you ever read Umberto Eco's uh, semiotics books? And yes, um, I, I've read it several times. I'm not sure I understand it, but basic theory is that anything we use, like a building, is telling us something. Um, you can drive through our campus and just kind of look around and probably pick out where the president's office is going to be because. We've got the 16 floor office building and um, it's the tallest thing between like, I don't know, Dallas and uh, um, uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, you're, you're gonna drive around and say, where do you think the president's off? Oh, at the top of that building, because that's where you go, right? And anybody that's read Yertle the Turtle knows that. Um, so yeah, the, the stuff communicates even if it's not words on a page. Uh, my clothes are telling you something about me. My my haircut, the kind of glasses I get. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Way I, there you know. are a couple of brothers over in Shreveport, I think, that are. I'm trying to think if those guys are architects or developers or what, but they do a. <clears throat> there's an online tour that they do, or it's a YouTube tour of downtown Shreveport, and they have coined this idea that, or, or derived this idea that empty parking lots are the tombstones of old buildings. Because wow. what they've done, well, it's a pretty profound idea because they, a lot of downtown Shreveport was old historical type stuff that has been since the victim of the wrecking ball. Mm. Uh, and one, one building that is famous, Bruce and I passed it a number of times and it was barely saved several years ago is the State Theater, the Strand Theater. Well, that was gonna be under the wrecking ball back in the eighties and some concerned citizens got together and started a foundation and they, I think they raised money too, but anyhow, they stopped it, but it was going to be turned down and become one of these so-called tombstones, i.e. a parking lot. And so these brothers go around and they show people around Shreveport, 
you know, here's a parking lot. But at one time, I think even they, they, they take pictures like old uh, photographs and they superimpose those things over those parking lots to show what was once there. And That's so sad. The, well, and yeah, our, our library science professor used to say that he had a theory that when we lose the information of these previous cultures and previous societies, we're losing part of our own, not just our own uh, culture, but our own humanity and our own civilization. Yeah. When we lose that knowledge, we're losing our, we're losing ourselves. Yes. Uh, and he was a historian of the book. That was, his area was history of the book as a form. Do you find people telling these, but yeah, these guys go around and they, they film this stuff? Do you find these people uh, that people are still telling these stories to their kids the way they used to? Like, um, is it being passed along anywhere that you go? Uh, I hope so, but you know, um, I mean, on YouTube, uh, I, I remember seeing she was, I think she, she died a few years ago, but she was a great Asian storyteller. And she used to, you know, it was a job, literally. And I saw these great women, from, uh, she's from Jamaica, but she lives in England and she's telling uh, stories. But you know, it's like a show. So she will go to schools, but she will right. also go to a big, uh, you know, arena and tell stories. But now the question is, do we have parents? I mean, you do have parents reading, uh, you know, folk tales, but I don't know if parents, there's a lot of parents who just like, create their own stories. And I don't think, like growing up, my parents read to me from printed books, but they didn't pass down folk tales that they yeah. had heard growing up. Uh, there were some tales about growing up on a farm that they would tell us occasionally, like uh, this is what it was like to be growing up when I was a kid. But you know, the, if you look at like, um, compare Lapin and, um, yeah, our baby that was passed down by word of mouth for probably a hundred years or more before it was ever written down. And it's paragraph for paragraph parallel to the version they tell in Senegal. So th th this oral culture can be a very powerful uh, tool. And I think we've, I don't know, my, my folks have kind of lost it. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, the word is written, we get lazy. <laughs> Do you see what yeah. I mean? Do you, uh, the story of Toth uh, told by um, Plato, uh, Toth invented writing and took it to the high God and he was so proud of it and said, I have created this tool for remembering and the high God told him, uh, no, you have created a tool for forgetting uh, oh, because yeah. if people write it down, they don't have to remember it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's it. And, you know, and I think that's, yeah, that's the, you know, technology, you do something to make your life easier. It's like, I only know my phone number. I remember like 20 years ago, I knew everyone's phone numbers by heart. Yeah, yeah. Now I've got my, it's, it's only my cell phone. If I lose my cell phone, I'm, you know, I'm done. I mean, I've lost all my friends. If I lose my phone, I could call myself. Um, <laughs> one of my ex-wives, my mother, I couldn't call any of my sons. Uh, <laughs> I don't know their numbers. <laughs> no, I, I only know mine, which is bad. I, I know I know my grandmother's because I knew it. Because it's so, my mom has had the same phone number since 1964. So yeah, I got that exactly. one. But anything else. So yeah, you're right. You know, when we're trying to do something to make our lives easier, we get uh, lazier too. <laughs> That's it. It's a, it's a paradox. I mean, our, our library science professor used to say that. Uh, and he would say that the more sophisticated the society becomes in terms of its infrastructure, its, you know, everything else that goes with that, its, its commerce, its, you know, political system, et cetera. He said there's a paradox where also the more fragile it becomes. Intellectually well, fragile, uh, you know, educationally fragile, et cetera. Uh, and, and I think he's correct about that. And I would say fragmented as well. Like um, yeah. I've got a 15 year old kid, an average night. I'll be one in one room uh, watching my TV and he'll be in his room uh, looking at YouTube and his mom will be in her room uh, watching TV. Uh, you know, three different things going at the same time. There's no community there. In the old days- Atomization. Would, yeah, in the old days you would sit around the fire and what you do when you sit around at the fire at night, you tell stories, you sing. Uh, that was kind of, you know, 
for most of the 300,000 years people have existed, that's how we've existed. And all of a sudden we've cut ourselves off from that. But remember then when they had books, everyone was in the same room reading different books. <laughs> they were not talking to each other. So again, literacy may not be good, but of course, as you know, literary professors, we're not going to say that, <laughs> but yeah. Everything uh, has its cost as- uh, Yeah, yeah. Part as, of, yeah but, you know, that's why Louisiana Anthology is great. Uh, because yeah. people can go online and you know and it's a great website i checked it i was like oh, oh you did. Thank I, mean, you. I, I i'm going to use it in my class in you know the next time i i took uh, my folktale class i'm going to use it one of our primary desires for our project is to be used in the classroom one so one reason we've kept everything free and online and it's friendly to whatever device you have if you have an iphone it looks good on an iphone if you've got a laptop it looks good on if you're throwing it up on the board to talk to them in class then uh you can blow it up as much as you like and you know still read it it doesn't go off the page uh so um we we appreciate you using our project because and we've not only got the creole stories but we've got a lot of native american stories and there as we mentioned earlier there's some overlap between those because they were in communication Oh, totally. I mean, one of my students' uh, final research paper was to look at the Sukunyan, you know, the, the skin, you know, the person taking the skin off, and the skinwalker. So, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, she didn't take a Native American course with me, but I think she's taken that before. So, she was looking at the convergence between the two. And then, you know, I put a lot of PDF online. So, I was like, ah, oh, I. I if I knew about your website, I would have like, go there. Would have saved me hours on PDFs, but hey. It's uh, there. Right. But you know, so, so, that, so that's why, you know, I really believe like, like intertextuality, what we're doing now, talking, exchanging ideas, this is how we could combat the paradox. And, you know, we could share, because now I know that you have a website mm. and I gave you some articles. And then we know that, you know, my job is wider than we think. Um, you can you cannot know that if you work you know in silos if you're really separ separated. So the separation then you know as scholars we work on our little things. We we we, we don't go far. The only way to go. That's far that's the it. the uh, beauty part of the beauty at least of the Louisiana Studies Conference each year because it doesn't just bring together people like we are like literary scholars or folklorists or I mean it's it's also bringing in historians bringing in geographers, you know, we've had people come in and talk about Louisiana geography, uh, the people that talk about uh, climatology too, which is particularly important because we're a coastal state. Yes. And so we're gonna suffer some of the worst effects of climate crisis. Uh, they bring in people who are ethnographers. And again, any anything that connects to Louisiana, the people, the culture here, the climate here, they bring those, you know, they, they send out this like a, a blast but it's a, it's an invitation to all kinds of scholars but also it's 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 friendly to the public i mean the public can come and listen to the presentations which i, I think is critical free. we you know, have to pay 50 dollars to present but it's not you know if you haven't uh presented there uh, they're um up in natchitoches i don't think that's too bad aren't you in houston during the school year yeah, i never know about it so you know i would i, I would happily come yeah you yeah. should come sometime it would um what the best thing I found about it is everybody a, is interested in Louisiana, where when I go to some of these other conferences, they're waiting for me to get through. So the person talking about twilight can get up and talk. And, uh, <laughs> and the other thing is networking. You meet a lot of people who have knowledge about various aspects of Louisiana um, culture. And Stephen and I, well, we always get several podcast episodes <laughs> you know okay can i get your number we're going to talk about this later <laughs> you get 15 minutes to talk about it there and then they can come on here and talk as long as they want to so uh, uh get to use that you know be a little more relaxed presenting their research but yeah it's a good it's a good uh and uh we stay at the it's a brand new hotel it is um the Hotel Saint Denis, uh, or the Chateau. Ooh, he has a French name. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. founder, the founder of Nacogdoches. He was that French Canadian guy that founded oh. the city. And, and it's a block and, off know, of Front Street, and it runs around a hundred dollars a night, which is you know what you pay for crappy hotels. So, uh, and no, that's, not, that's good. 
It's yeah. The, 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 the last time that we went in person was it three years ago, Bruce? I think. That's right. But we, I was getting my gear. I have some disability with my back, so I have a lot of chronic spinal pain. So I was getting my gear, like a cushion, some other stuff to bring inside to where I could sit down comfortably. And I no more than got to the big, big building where they hold this, you know, all the different, the big convocation, and then all the, the breakout sessions, a lot of glass on the front of the building, a lot of glass in area. So I looked through the glass and there's Bruce standing off to the side, waving at me to come over and join him and this other guy who was also named Bruce. And it turned out he, he follows us every week. And he is a, you know, different from what Bruce and I at least originally started doing with our project. He's a Southernist. He does Southern lit. So he could be doing just as easily Southern history, Southern geography. He nice. does Southern literature uh, out east of where I grew up in Baton Rouge. He, he teaches at Southeastern in Hammond. But that and was the first said, time we met him. I was texting you yeah. this week. So you'll make friends there that you uh, yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. So yeah. I'll be looking for that, yeah. We always because, invite people to come to that conference because it's, it's my be favorite fun. conference, yeah. It is, yeah, it's I've a done, fine conference. I've done some work with a friend, uh, um, Sidonie de la Housse. I don't know if you know her. Uh, so because you know, she was a white Creole living in Louisiana. And you know Dolly Hertig? She's our French teacher at Tech. Oh, okay. Dollyanna Hertig. Um, she did uh, Cotafield, didn't she, Bruce? The yeah, she was in charge of Cotafield. Oh, years. nice. Okay. Because yeah. we, we study Cotafield, my students, too. Because, you know, I'm doing Louisiana. When I'm doing Francophone cultures, I'm like, I want us to realize that French people were bad. We were everywhere. <laughs> we colonized. Yeah. Well, it's different. Yeah. I would like more French brought back. I would uh, I'd like everybody to learn both languages growing up maybe spanish too but you know yeah. i mean because you know, it's a part of a of, of a richness so it's always interesting for the students to learn about the codophil and the struggle uh you know of the people who are trying to keep french do they want to to speak a cajun french or you know like yeah and it's always political you know culture is always political right absolutely that. Yeah, if louisiana had done what quebec did about the same yeah. time we could have held on to our French, but we were too busy trying to get rid of it. You know, let's not do that. Let's be American. Well, yeah, but let's still speak French. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but remember that, you know, American government kind of banned the teaching of, uh, of French in Louisiana. Was it like 1919 or 1908? I can't remember. Yeah, it's Actually. near the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, sometimes. so oh, I mean, that, that's why the students, it's it's harder to keep the culture when the government is like, yeah, no, you're not doing it. It is. We didn't know what we had. Yeah, you know. But the, the beauty is now you, people are working on it. So we see nothing is easy in life. No. Well, thank you so much. This has been great. And I've been excited about it because we're uh, getting ready to do a presentation in a few months. And uh, I wanted to learn more about this folktale. And it's very interesting to me that it has such similar roots in two very different countries that come together in, uh, in the way that we, we read it today. Yeah, and then continents. But you know, like in the article I sent you, you have a useful bibli I think bibliography, like in English too. Right, <laughs> right, right. But that, that could like, I think could be useful for you to, uh, for your own discussion. Right. That was great. I learned a lot too. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much, Jacques. Yeah, we really appreciate uh, you. I hope you'll continue to uh, push the uh, folktales. I think that's great work you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much. Au revoir. Okay. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Et merci. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs>